I'm excited to tell you about modular forms. First, I want to thank the organizers very much for the invitation. This is my first time at the CIRM. It's been fantastic. Um, so I want to tell you about a way to compute modular forms using uh, a generalization of a method of Birch. Uh, in 1991, I understand, based on a 1988 talk here in Lumini, Birch gave an algorithm to compute classical modular forms of weight 2. Uh, and it's based on a HECA action on ternary quadratic forms, which is maybe a, an unusual place to see things like elliptic curves and the like, but they're really there. Um, Birch was motivated by an analogy to uh, la méthode de graph. Uh, for those of you who don't speak French, that translates to the method of graphs. <laughs> this method is due to Mestre and Osterle. And uh, its uh, executive summary goes like this. There's a natural Hecke action on the set of super singular elliptic curves in prime characteristic n via the p isogeny graph, if you want the Hecke operator at p. And if you look at what this Hecke module is, so you equip a vector space with a bunch of commuting operators, you end up with the modular forms of weight 2 for gamma 0 n. So I said prime characteristic n. That tends to happen for finite fields. And Birch wanted to extend this to a method that would work more generally for composite n. So this was uh, about 30 years ago. Um, here's what Birch has to say about it. Uh, there's a great deal of interesting information to be calculated. Since the program is very fast, it is possible for anyone who owns it to generate interesting numbers much faster than it's possible to read them. This attempt, however, has so far failed in two ways. First, it usually gives only half the information needed. And second, when the level is not square free, it gives even less information. At least the program is very fast. <laughs> Characteristic of Birch. So today, what I'd like to explain to you is uh, how to extend Birch's method to compute forms as long as the level n is not a square. OK, so that's, that's pretty, pretty good. Can't do them all. It's still very fast. <laughs> OK. Our method works for Hilbert modular forms over totally real fields. If you know me, I love a good totally real field. Um, but because it's the morning, I'm just going to stick to Q. So for those of you who want to understand things more generally, um, you can ask me afterwards. Is that a question already? Yeah, so you mean non-square and not square free? Ex I mean, n is not a square, yeah. So like. 3 times 5 squared is OK. Yeah. OK. So to begin, I need to describe to you the Hecke action on ternary quadratic forms that was introduced by Birch. So I, let me set up a bit of notation first. Um, let Q from V to uh, the rational numbers be a positive definite ternary quadratic space. So the ternary here is just the dimension of V as a Q vector space. I associate the bilinear form uh, Txy uh, defined in this way. I don't divide by 2. Um, I'm going to work with lattices. So a lattice inside V is a free Z module of rank 3 that contains a basis for the vector space. So you can think of it as the span, the Z span of a basis, a Q vector space basis for V. I ask that my lattice lambda, which is like taking the V and flipping it around for the notation. Um, I require it to be integral, so I ask that my quadratic form take values in z on this lattice. Um, once you choose a basis, which is always a brutal thing to do to a vector space in a lattice, but to do some computations, you have to do that sort of thing, um, then you see the quadratic form associated to the lattice. So you evaluate the bilinear form to, uh, at the um, at each pair of basis vectors, and you end up with coefficients a, b, c, u, v, w. The fact that it's integral means that these values, uh, the, the coefficients of that quadratic form, live in the integers. There's a vice versa way of doing this, which is just to say if someone gave you an integral positive definite ternary quadratic form and you want to make a quadratic space with a lattice, well, you just tensor with q. So you take the e1, e2, e3 to be 
um, the standard basis of Q cubed. So I will move often back and forth between quadratic spaces and lattices. Um, that the ability, you might prefer one or the other, but I promise you that the ability to move uh, back and forth between them leads to the most insight. There are a few quantities associated with such a lattice. We define its discriminant, which is also the discriminant of the ternary quadratic form, to be the determinant of the Gram matrix divided by two. Um, the reason to do that divided by two is because if you didn't divide by two, you would see a polynomial in ABC UVW that all coefficients were divisible by two. So this is sometimes called the half discriminant. Um, it's just an extra factor of two that you would have to keep around, but it doesn't belong there. So um, that's the discriminant. Okay, those are the basic invariants that we need for our ternary quadratic spaces. Now let me tell you about the genus. Okay, so we have the basic uh, groups acting on our vector space. So we ask for the linear change of the variables uh, of V that preserve the quadratic form, and we call that the orthogonal group. We'll also need the special orthogonal group, so those we require the determinant to be one. Um, and we define O, lambda, et cetera. So you ask for the things that uh, map the lattice to itself. Um, in that context, uh, such a transformation which preserves the lattice, you look at the group of all those things because we have a lattice inside a positive definite quadratic space that's a finite group. Um, lat we say that the two lattices are isometric and we write it uh, this way. If you can find an isometry of your lattice that maps, uh, of, your, of your quadratic space that maps lambda to pi. So that is to say that you are preserving length and angle in your ambient vector space that maps one basis to the other. We'll make the same definitions about isometric over QP and over R, it won't matter. Um, we define the genus to be all of the lattices lam, uh, pi inside V with the property that lambda P is isometric to pi P, where lambda P is, as usual, you tensor with ZP, so you consider it as a lattice for ZP, so that just requires you, uh, you're allowed to invert things that are relatively prime to P, that's one way to think about it, and that allows you to match up your quadratic form in more ways. Um, the class set is the set of iso global isometry classes in the genus. And the main theorem of this slide is the, by the geometry of numbers, this class set is a finite set. So you may have seen this uh, in the language of binary quadratic forms and its relationship to the class group of an imaginary quadratic field. Um, there you again see a geometry of numbers argument to conclude that the thing is finite. Okay, so the thing to take away from this slide is isometric class set. That's really gonna be the basis of our Z module where we're gonna find our modular forms, okay? So how do you compute this class set after all? How are you, if I gave you a quadratic form, how are you gonna find all the ones that are everywhere locally equivalent up to global, global equivalents? How do you find that? How am also I have to produce for you HECA matrices somehow to define an action? Well, both of those have the same answer. It's called P neighbors. So the theory of P neighbors is due to Knazer, and it gives not only an effective method to compute the class set, it also gives the heck action. So you just really need to understand one slide to understand them all, so to generate them. So here we go. Uh, I choose a prime P that doesn't divide the discriminant of my lattice. Um, I still ask that lambda be integral. And yes, it's okay to take P is equal to two. We also need the heck operator at two. So um, I know that makes everybody nervous uh, to have a quadratic space and P is equal to two, but I ha you, you have to take my assurances that at least for this slide, it's okay. We, we also compute T2, okay. So we say, uh, we're, gonna, we're trying to find lattices. Um, so we say a lattice pi is a P neighbor of lambda. And we'll write it like this, pi sim P lambda. So it's, uh, if, it, if, it, if uh, pi satisfies the following condition, I take lambda, I intersect it with pi, and I consider the index of that lattice inside lambda and pi separately. So I ask that the index of this intersection is exactly P in both cases. So that's what it means to be a P neighbor. It's not just, uh, maybe if you're used to heck action, it's like uh, you look at the lattices of index P. That's what you would do for, for GL2 kinds of things. But in order to preserve the quadratic space, I don't just look and to stay in the genus, I can't just look at things of index P. I have to recover somehow by not, because I don't want to change the discriminant of the lattice, for example. So that requires you to sort of go up and down at the same time, okay? But I'm not changing the lattice at any prime Q not equal to P. So if I were to tensor with ZQ because the index is P, I'm really taking the same lattice there. So it's like changing the lattice one prime at a time and seeing how many things I can generate in the genus this way. So if I have a P neighbor, uh, they, I have the following three properties. The discriminant is the same. 
pi is necessarily integral, and the pi is, in, again, in the genus of lambda. Um, there is an effectively computable finite set S of primes such that every class in the class set of lambda is an iterated S neighbor. So what I mean by that is you start with lambda, you take a P1 neighbor, you take a P2 neighbor of that, and so on, and you end up with a representative of your class lambda prime. Um, the PI have to come from the set S. Um, this reason why you have to take possibly a finite set is the usual issue between spinner genera and usual genera, which everybody universally puts under the rug. Um, the way to do that is to say typically you can take S to just be any prime that doesn't divide the discriminant. You need something like a prime to divide the discriminant to some high power. Weird stuff has to happen at two. But the promise I can make to you is that there's an, always an effectively computable set S of primes that will generate everything. Okay, so the thing you, does this make sense? This is the main, the main concept here about neighbors, yes? Two. Is that set bounded? I don't think so. Spinner genera can be quite large. That condition uh, lambda, how do you call that, equivalent to P? Yeah, P neighbor. Uh, P neighbor. Is that for one P to get the three, three bullets or for all P? Oh, no, I, I just take, two, P, pi is a P neighbor of lambda for some P and pi will have those three properties. Yeah, so I asked, is it for, you need it only for one P? Yep. Yes, yep, okay, great. Is so the, the definition that the pi has to be integral, or, is, or not, or you're saying it's a constant? Uh, let's have a part of the definition, because I really want to only work with integral ones. Okay, so how do you compute neighbors? How would you make this effective? Um, here's, here, here we go. I'll give you two equivalent ways to think about neighbors that I hope makes it totally transparent in addition to the, to the theoretical definition. So the first one is uh, pi is a p neighbor of lambda if and only if the following condition holds. First of all, lambda and pi need to be the same lattice at all primes q not equal to p. And second, there is a basis, a ZP basis for lambda p. We, we call this a p standard basis because a lot of our algorithms work uh, relative to this, and it needs to satisfy a few properties. Here they are. The first one just says that E1, E2, E3 is a ZP basis for lambda P. The second one shows you how you make a, the pi P. Isn't this cute? You like divide the first lattice vector by P and you multiply the second lattice, uh, multiply by P. That's a sort of, in, and you see the intersection now, right? When you intersect, you lose something at E you lose E2, but you gain something in E1. And that's an allowable move. Uh, it's an isometry of the quadratic space if you've normalized your quadratic form over ZP to look like this, XY plus I don't care Z squared. So the XY, you guys probably recognize that as a hyperbolic plane. That's what, what it's called in the, the language of quadratic forms. And then I take the orthogonal complement to that. And so inside this hyperbolic plane, I'm allowed to, you can think about the matrix P, one over P, does that preserve the quadratic form? Yes, it does because when I multiply x by one over p and y by p, I've preserved lengths, and I take the orthogonal complement to that, okay? That's all that's happening with, with p neighbors once you realize that your quadratic form is hyperbolic. So that really used that p didn't divide the discriminant of the lattice um, so that you re recognize it up to isometry as a hyperbolic plane together with, with something uh, anisotropic one-dimensional, okay? So um, here's another way that makes this even more effectively computable, I hope to convince. So it's, I guess it's clear from the previous bullet that we need to understand uh, hyperbolic uh, subspaces of our quadratic space, which is means in particular I need to understand isotropic lines. So you can make a P neighbor in the following way. You find a vector V in lambda that's isotropic. I need to lift it a little bit using Hensel's lemma. So this is the 2p squared is so that I can think about a zp line as the same thing as being with enough digits of p-adic precision and it's enough to work in 2p squared. Um, and uh, then I make my pi by taking p inverse of v. The v would have been the e1 in the previous bullet. And then I add all the rest of the things in my lattice, but I require them to be live in pz with respect to the bilinear form. And that's because I just divided my V by P, so I have to take things that pair with V with a multiple of P to cancel out that factor that I wrote down there. So you see, for example, in the, the hyperbolic 
plane, because it paired with it to be equal to 1, I have to take p times the multiple of that of the E2. And then in the E3, because it was in the orthogonal complement, I can take the whole lattice. Okay? So now, if you believe these two bullet points, the second one tells you that to make a neighbor, I need to loop over the isotropic lines. For those, it's, you, you should be staring at the quadratic form xy plus qe3z squared to realize that that conic becomes isomorphic to p1. So, they'll be exact, so the line spanned by v uniquely determines the pi, and there are p plus 1 of these neighbors, um, exactly given by the appropriate lifts of the points on p1. So that they, they're canonically identified once you, once you have a p-standard basis in this way by, by looping over the elements. So is, is that clear? So there's p plus 1 neighbors. You find them by manipulating the quadratic form mod p or over zp, equivalently think, think about them. And that, those algorithms don't even change the sizes very much because you're, you're basically doing a computation mod p, so you have some log p factors. But it's extremely efficient to compute these in any of the, the two equivalent ways that I've written down here. Okay, so if I give you quadratic space, I can make the neighbors. I have to compute the set S. Once I have those, I have all the neighbors. I claim that they all uh, belong to one of the classes. So the, uh, let's do an example before I uh, get too far ahead. It's been a lot of slides, so I want to make sure everything's super concrete. Um, here's a quadratic form. The invariants I told you about them were the bilinear form. Notice the twos down the diagonal because of my definition. Um, you can compute the discriminant of this by taking the determinant of that 3 by 3 matrix. Um, I claim that the class set is of size 2. I do that by computing the three neighbors. I don't know why I was allergic to 2. Maybe I just didn't want you guys to worry. Um, so when you compute the three neighbors, you see there are four of them. You, uh, you find one new one in the three neighbors, and you recognize some that are isometric to the other two. And then when you compute another three neighbor, um, all of the ones that you've seen uh, it, the three new ones that you would see by iterating the process are all isometric to the previous ones. And there's a connectedness argument which says that that gives you the entire class set. So in the next slide, I'll explain to you how to check for isometry. But here's the three neighbor. Um, it, see, it doesn't look too bad. And then I guess if you want to see the corresponding quadratic form, again, you just take the original quadratic form on the, the space with respect to this new basis. Okay? So that's an example to keep in mind as we go forward about what what the space will look like. For example, for discriminant 11, I have two, two forms. Okay. Um, how do you compute uh, the HECA action? Let me do that right away because it's just given by the P neighbors. I'm going to define something called the uh, space of orthogonal modular forms for lambda. I, I'll say trivial weight with the whole crux of the talk being that we'll change the, the weight to a different representation. But it's a trivial now. How not scary is this? I take the finite set of the class set, and I consider maps to C. Everyone can visualize that vector space, right? If you take the characteristic functions for lambda, then you can identify that is a canonical basis if you want to. Um, and there, however many of there there are, I take one, the value one at the lattice lambda and zero elsewhere. Um, how do you make a heck operator? Well, I have to give you an operator from maps on the class set to maps on the class set. So I take a map, and I give you another map. How is that map defined? Well, it eats a class, isometry class of lattices, and it spits out the sum of the values of f over all the p neighbors of the class lambda prime. So this is a sum with p plus 1 elements. Does it feel like the usual heck operators on, on GL2? I hope so. So the only difference is we're not summing over lattices of index p. We have a different notion of p neighbor. OK? Um, now you want all of the good properties of heck operators, right? They better commute. They're self-adjoined with respect to a natural inner product, which won't feature here. Um, and in particular, there's a basis of simultaneous eigenvectors, which we call eigenforms, to borrow the language of, with classical case. OK, so what is the, how do I compute the heck action, and how do I even check for isometry, that, which was necessary to compute the genus? Um, well, as you saw in the previous sum, you have to sort things according to their classes, right? I mean, if I, for example, in the characteristic functions, I'm just counting how many are isometric to the one that I care about. That, that's the way to think about the heck action. So here it is. Um, the first way to think about it is that there is uh, an algorithm of Pleskin and Souvenier, which just says if I have a lattice in a quadratic space, uh, over everything over z and over q, um, then I can check for isometry. So there, there's some algorithm that does that. It's a pretty cool algorithm. It matches up short vectors and use lots of other tricks, 
to compute an isometry or to rule it out if, as early as possible. Okay, so for example, an isometry is going to have to take all the short vectors of a given length and map it to the, the corresponding short vectors of a given length. So you got that, those have to match up. For example, if you only have one short ve one vector of a given length, it has to match to another vector of a given length, and you only have to have one of those. Okay? So pretty soon you discover that there isn't an isometry or what the candidate isometry is, and then you just check that it's the right one. So that, that's extremely efficient, implemented in magma, great stuff. Um, in fixed dimension, it's also theoretically efficient. So there's been an analysis of what actually goes on. Do you have enough short vectors to um, determine the isometry and that, all that? But actually, in our case, we can do even better. I hope you guys like this. This is already in Birch's original paper. There's an explicit reduction theory of integral ternary quadratic forms um, that goes back to Eisenstein. And it's just like the Gauss reduction of integral binary quadratic forms. You guys like that, right? A, B, C, you take the corresponding root in the upper half plane, you translate it to have real part but, uh, absolute value bounded by uh, half, and then if you're in below the unit circle, you flip and you repeat. So that gives a fundamental domain for um, integral positive definite quadratic forms, and it gives you an algorithm to give a unique representative. You have to choose how you're going to break ties if you're on the boundary of the fundamental domain. There's the same thing for ternary forms. It's really, it's great. Explicit inequalities for what it means to be a reduced form. Really beautiful and really fast. So of course, if you want to do isometry checking and you have an algorithm that gives you a unique reduced form, all you have to do is table lookup. You say which one of these is in the list. So that's better because you're not going one by one and checking to see if you're isometric or not. You're just saying uh, you hash it and you look it up in the table. So it's, it, that's uh, way faster and way cool. Okay, ready for the example again? So um, you guys remember discriminant 11, there's two forms. Um, here's what the heck operators look like. So what did I do? I have two classes, so for the first class, I say uh, which, uh, I look at the, for T3, for example, I have four neighbors. I say among the four neighbors, which are you isometric to? And I'll write them in the rows. Um, so apparently two of them were isometric to the first guy and two of them were isometric to the second guy. That's my new one. And then I do repeat the algorithm for the lambda prime. And I see, oh, okay, for that one, I guess they sorted themselves according to 3-1. That's, that's the representation. Yeah, true. When you say sort, you're not literally defining order. You're nope. just trying to partition the bias. Yep. I, I mean, like, uh, they, they came to me in an order. I'm like, you go over here. Like the sorting hat in, uh, in Harry Potter. <laughs> Gryffindor, Gryffindor. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's all I mean by sorting. Yeah. Can I ask you to repeat the question? Oh, of course. I'm sorry. Yeah, the question was, what did I mean by sorting? And the answer is the sorting hat. I will do that in the future. OK. All right, you guys, remember eigenfunctions? There's, a, there's an obvious eigenfunction called 1, 1. Those correspond to the constant functions. What is their eigenvalue going to be? This is to see if you've been paying attention. The answer is p plus 1, right? So for every, every the constant function, no matter what it takes, doesn't matter which one you got sorted by, uh, you just count the number of neighbors. We call this an Eisenstein series for the, for the obvious reasons. That, that's always there. With respect to the uh, natural inner product, you take the complement, you end up with things that you would call cusp forms for no good reason. You have a good reason, I guess, the analogy, but they know cusps, so don't, don't think that there's, that corresponds to some kind of vanishing. So in a two-dimensional space, I took the orthogonal complement, and one, so I got some, some eigenvector that's going to have some interesting properties, right? Discriminant 11. I hope you know what I'm going to say next. Uh, here's what the eigenvector is. And you can compute the eigenvalues here, minus 1, 1. I guess they're, they're not of abs all of absolute value 1. That, that just happened. Um, this corresponds to a modular form. At least for this slide, you just say, wow, these eigenvalues match up. And I have to give you a theorem that explains, in general, what modular forms we're going to get this way. But at least you can match up, well, the, uh, the first A3 coefficient. That's about all you can see. Um, there's one other piece of information I need that's going to play an important role, which is the atkin lehner involution. So that's the z goes to minus 1 over 11z. If you consider the f uh, that I've written down here um, as a function on the upper half plane, then when you apply this involution, um, you get eigenvalue minus 1. So when the prime exactly divides the level, the atkin lehner is the negative of the Hecke eigenvalue. That, that doesn't hold for when p squared divides the level. But here, just in case you want to see its relationship to the a11, um, it's the negative. Yeah? Is there a reason you left off a2? Is there a reason I left off a2? I was, 
I was just doing it for sensitivities in the audience for p is equal to 2. But no, there's no reason not to compute the two neighbors. Actually, that's, it's so much fun to do that, you can almost do it by hand. But Birch encourages us to do that in the paper, that uh, especially with the reduction theory, you don't need a magma infrastructure in order to compute these things. It's, so the T2 would be a perfect thing to see if you um, understand. Yeah. Okay, so two questions. One, did you choose, did, was it important for you or to you to have prime discriminant? No. no. It was not important to have prime discriminant. Okay, and two, how did you, how many of these coefficients did you need to <coughs> How many of the APF you needed to match to get the modular form? I have a theorem, so I knew in advance what I was going to get. So I didn't actually have to compute this. I just wanted you to see what it looks like. So are you ready for the theorem then? I think the theorem is next. OK. Um, here's the theorem. So uh, first, let me have a bit of notation. S is going to be the orthogonal complement of the constant functions, just like we saw in the previous example. Um, this theorem I will attribute to Birch and also my uh, former PhD student, Jeff Hine. So I'll explain that after I state the theorem, the attribution. So at this stage, n is square free. That's the situation that Birch proved and that my student uh, also proved. Um, I, need, I have to tell you a space of modular forms. And it's defined with the following data. So I have to tell you the p vit invariant of the quadratic space for all p dividing n. I'll do that in two slides, I think. But for now, there's a sign, plus or minus 1, that I, assi that I associate to every prime dividing n. It's related to a Clif Clifford invariant, if you want to think about it. But I'll be very precise later. I take d to be the product of all of those vit invariants where, that are minus 1. I call that capital D. So D divides n. So there's a Hecke equivariant inclusion from the space of orthogonal modular forms to the weight 2 cusp forms for gamma 0 n. So you automatically know that I'm going to get forms of level n. That already told you that for discriminant 11, I had to get the, that space is one dimensional for cusp forms. So I had to get that other guy. What is the precise image? Well, the image is the following uh, somewhat clunkily written thing. I have to take two, two things. I need to be nu at d, and I have to have w equals epsilon. Okay, what, what does that mean? That means I take forms on, on the level gamma 0 n. I ask that f is nu at all primes p dividing d. So it does not come from a, poor, a form where, uh, where p does not divide the level. So if forms have to be nu at p. And I do that for all the p dividing d. And then I ask that the atkin lehner involution at p agrees with the epsilon p that I started with. So that has to agree with the vit invariant of the quadratic space. Does that make sense? So uh, uh, in the big, big space of uh, modular forms, it's carved up by the action of a whole lot of involutions, one for every prime dividing n. And depending on whether or not it's plus or minus 1, the corresponding quadratic space tells me which of these subspaces that I get. So that's really good, especially if n has lots of prime divisors. Apparently, I'm getting a much smaller subspace of a large space of, of modular forms. Now, uh, I promised you an explanation for the attribution. So Birch sketches two arguments for this theorem. He suggests a, a way to prove it, but doesn't actually state any theorems. Okay, so um, his proofs can be made. He gives two suggestions. Both of them can be made to work. So uh, it was the task of, of Jeff to complete the proof using one of these arguments and write out all the details. So he does a great job in his, in his thesis writing down uh, exactly what happens. And even, he even does it over a totally real field. So you can see what happens in the presence of a non-trivial class group. Okay, so uh, that's, uh, that was the result of Birch. Um, and it tells you that you always are getting classical modular forms. It tells you which space you're getting based on the quadratic space and the square free level. Um, I guess I should owe you a definition of the, of the vid invariant, okay? Because there are lots of different ways of associating invariants to quadratic forms, but this is a really a natural one, okay? So it comes, this is also the method that uh, Jeff uses to prove the uh, inclusion. So it's called the even Clifford algebra, which is one of my favorite things. Um, you knew there was going to be a quaternion algebra at some point, if you know me well. Uh, it's, it's a hard habit to break. Once you go quaternion, you can't go back. Um, when you have an ter integral ternary quadratic form, I just remind you, this is what it looks like of discriminant n. I'm going to make for you an order in a quaternion algebra. Okay, so the order 
is called the even Clifford algebra. I'm gonna spare you the functorial properties and just tell you what it is. It's called O, cliff zero, okay. Um, it is uh, an ordered, so it's a, right now it's a, a rank four Z module that I'm gonna make into a ring. Okay, so it has generators one, I, J, and K, and here's the multiplication table. Um, I, I squared is U, I minus B, C, where the U and the B and the C came from the coefficients of the quadratic form. I'll define an involution by the usual one. So that the, if you think of I as being the root of that polynomial, I take the other root, which is called U minus I. So for each of those generators, I'm gonna define an involution on the algebra, one goes to one, and extend that Z linearly. And then I'm gonna make the multiplication J times K to be A times I bar. So I bar here is U minus I. So that's how I multiply. There are, of course, symmetric expressions uh, in J and K and the V and the A's that give you the full multiplication table. I'm almost done, except that I have to tell you how to multiply on the other side. But the standard involution, as I've written it down, reverses the order. So I can t apply the bar twice, the bar reverses the order, I know what the bar of those two things is, and then I can bar it again. So that tells you, in other words, the multiplication is determined by one-sided multiplication in the presence of, uh, of a standard involution. An involution is standard if it's an anti-isomorphism uh, and you multiply something times its, uh, an its involute and you get something that lives in Z. That's what it means to be a standard involution, like the reduced norm on a quaternion algebra. Um, you, here's where the quaternion algebra shows up. If you tensor with Q, then you can complete the square. You just need it to be able to divide by two. And then you get the usual representation. Of course, there'll be different I's and J's in that representation, but uh, maybe it's useful to think about the special case where U, V, and W are all zero. If you were working over Q, you could have exactly that after you complete the square. The answer would be minus four AB, the discriminant would be four ABC, and you would get the usual thing where you take minus AB, minus AC, minus AB, minus BC, and the, so the three symmetric ways of writing that. That's one of the usual ways that people um, define invariance of quadratic spaces. Okay, so I did this integrally. Um, the thing to take away from this slide is if you give me an integral quadratic form, I can make for you an order in a quaternion algebra. Okay, um, is an order, in a, and the quaternion algebra is supposed to be visibly definite. A, B, and N all have to be positive because of the positive definiteness condition. Okay, so this association that eats a quadratic form and spits out uh, an order is functorial and induces a reduced discriminant preserving bijection between lattices up to isometry and quaternion orders up to isomorphism. So this really is the, uh, a real crown jewel that to understand, maybe you don't like quaternion orders and you want to understand quadratic forms or you think you understand quadratic forms and you want to understand quaternion orders, this even Clifford map allows a, a really nice functorial correspondence. You can upgrade this to an equivalence of categories with more uh, circumlocution. Um, now comes the vid invariant. Uh, you guys know that a, for a quaternion algebra, I have ramified or not as an invariant. So for my lattice, my, uh, inside a quadratic space, it will only depend on the ambient quadratic space, I take the associated quaternion algebra and I say, are you ramified or not? So that is called the discriminant of the quaternion algebra. And if in the square-free case, this vid invariant is exactly minus one if the quaternion algebra is ramified, and it's one if it's not. Okay, so I hope that makes the vid invariant seem like a natural thing to be concerned about. There's a functorial correspondence to quaternion orders inside algebras, and I have to keep track of the ramification set of that quaternion algebra. There's one other piece of data I'll need here. Um, there's a, the quaternion algebra acts naturally, the, the, the invertible elements in the quaternion algebra act by conjugation on the trace zero elements. And so if you take the associated quadratic space that describes the entire special orthogonal group of that vector space. This is actually what motivated Hamilton in the first case to write down his quaternions, the minus one, minus one over R. He wanted to understand rotations in three-dimensional space. The same thing is true for any quadratic form, quadratic space. Um, and if you uh, restrict to the integral things, you get a similar looking exact sequence. So in other words, in the proto equivalence of categories, the stabilizers are the same on both sides too. So if you want to understand self isometries, those correspond to the units in the quaternion algebra up to plus or minus one. Okay, uh, now let me sketch very quickly the proof of the theorem because that's, that's where there's interesting theoretical content. This is the Bertheim theorem. Um, so I just claimed that the even Clifford algebra gives you um, uh, a bijection between ternary quadratic forms and quaternion orders. And the claim is that that's 
respects the heck operators because it's functorial. So um, that gives you a natural map from the space of orthogonal modular forms, which was just maps on a class set, to maps on what's called the type set of O. The type set is the set of local isomorphism classes of orders in a given genus up to global isometry. That, that should make sense if I'm defining the genus of a ternary quadratic space, I take the genus of the order. I have a bijection between the two sets, y'all. So the, the map there is just, I take the map, I see which one it goes to. No, nothing could be clearer, I think, it, of all the things that Langlands and automorphic induction provides us. Nothing could be clearer about a map, uh, maps on a finite set and maps on a finite set when I have a bijec bijection between the two finite sets. Okay, it just respects Hecke. Isn't that awesome? Okay, so then you need to know what the heck do you get by taking maps on the type set. And this was uh, Eichler's Anzal Matrizen, um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's easily identified what the image is by keeping track of what happens with the involution. So it's a, a little more work to say precisely what the image is, but if you have quaternionic modular forms, um, then this is, these are very closely related to classical modular forms. This goes all the way back to Brandt and Hecke, who was obsessed with the recursion that was found uh, uh, on, with his operators and Brandt filled in the details and is part of the Eichler basis problem and is, and is a very well understood, well studied thing. So we, instead of going straight for the target of classical modular forms, we say we embed you inside a quaternionic version in a transparent way and then we leave the trace formula or local Langlands to tell us what to do on the last step. So um, that breaks up the problem into uh, two pieces where you don't have to worry about theta series and vanishing and stuff like that. Okay, so that's how the theorem is proven. Um, once we realize this, now we can see how to find the other forms. Okay, so we're only getting certain forms based on the quadratic space. So how do you get the other ones? What happens if you want to change the signs? Um, how do you realize all of the maps? So where, where are the other forms? That's the main, the main topic today. Um, so to get them all, we're going to add a representation. I hope that seems like a natural thing to do. We took triv maps to C, so let's take maps to a representation. That's the, that's the idea. So here's the general setup. Um, I'll let rho be a representation of my orthogonal group, this is over Q, into some finite dimensional C vector space. You don't have to work over C, but I'm just trying to simplify. So think about complex representation of the orthogonal group. What do those things look like? Um, we'll, we'll call them the weight. Um, the one that we talked about at the very beginning was called the trivial representation, where you map everything to one. It's a perfectly good representation. Um, you could take the standard representation if you want to. So V has its orthogonal group that's acting on a three-dimensional vector space. That's A representation. Um, if you want ultimately higher weight, you'll have to do things like take harmonic polynomials in three variables of a given um, degree, and that will give you also a natural representation. So if, and they go on like this. The, the representation theory of, of the orthogonal group is well understood. Um, here's the representation we need. It's called the spinner character. So uh, here comes the spinner character. So you start in the orthogonal group. You mod out by plus or minus one. You realize that's isomorphic to SOV because if I was minus one would be minus one, minus one, minus one, that has determinant minus one. So I either already had determinant one or I could change it by minus one and then I land in SO. Um, by the exact sequence that I wrote down, which I called Hamilton's exact sequence, this is isomorphic to B star mod Q star. This is the action by conjugation. Then I take the reduced norm on the quaternion algebra. So that maps me into Q star mod Q star squared. So that, everyone follow that composition okay? So that, that map gives me a way of associating a rational number non-zero up to squares given any element uh, isometry of my quadratic space. That's called the spinner norm. And I'm just going to keep track of the piadic ords of the image. So that'll only be well defined up to squares. And so, uh, oh yeah, here's the most beautiful lemma that I will tell you today. Okay, so if you want to know what the image of gamma is in SOV, if its trace is not minus one, then the class in Q star mod Q star squared of the spinner norm is the trace plus one. How, how beautiful is that? So I do not have to compute this complicated looking homomorphism, if I take my three by three matrix after having choose, chosen a base of the quadratic space, I just take the trace plus one. That, that's the image, isn't that amazing? It's almost too beautiful to be true, I think. But it is true. Okay, there's more complicated, but still nice formulas when the trace is minus one, but I'll, I'll spare you those today. 
And like I said, we're gonna keep track of the valuations. So for r dividing n, we map to q star mod q star squared, and then we map to plus, plus or minus one by taking minus one to the ord p for all p dividing r. So it's like, if I care about what's happening at p, I'll take plus or minus one if p divides u or not, and for an individual r, I'll keep track of those, those uh, divisibility properties. Okay, so that's a homomorphism from ov to plus or minus one. If I plug that in to my modular forms, um, here's how that would look. I'd take classes, lambda one up to lambda h. Maybe I'll take my first one to just be lambda. I'm gonna define for you now orthogonal modular forms of weight rho instead of th this, which this generalizes the previous definition where I take trivial weight. And I ask for maps not to the complex numbers, but maps to the vector space w. And I ask that the image lands in the fixed space. If I take the class lambda i, I want it to be I, the only image that I'm allowed to take are vectors that are fixed under this finite group, which were the automorphisms of the lattice lambda i. So that's a natural uh, a thing that shows up because of the indeterminacy of if I had an isometry that maps one thing to the other, only be well-defined up to the orthogonal group. That's, that's not, this is like a direct sum of h zeros. Um, so if you, this generalizes the characteristic functions where we take a direct sum over the classes one up to h, and then I take uh, the fixed subspace. Um, here's how the heck operators work. Um, as soon as you have a p neighbor, the whole claim of p neighbors was I have p plus one of them, and I wrote down all the possible classes. So whatever my p neighbor was, it is isometric to one of the guys, we'll call it lambda j, by some isometry gamma. That gamma is well defined up to right multiplication by the orthogonal group, you see that, it could, so that explains the indeterminacy. And then all I do to do the sec operator, again, I have to take a map, produce another map. To do that, I sum over the p neighbors, and I insert the representation in the following way. Instead of just taking um, f of lamp, the class that I wrote down, which was just counting them, I take the value, but I push it with the representation. So in other words, the p neighbor, although however it was isometric to my fixed classes, I take my value f and I move it via the isometry. Okay, so the, all of the methods for computing p neighbors and the isometry classes keeps track of this gamma, and so I can still take an appropriate basis of characteristic functions, and that gives me a space of modular forms. More or less, I'm just gonna take plus or minus one instead of one, so it's like a, a, a signed sum based on what isometry and the p divisibility of that isometry according to the spinner norm. Um, all the nice properties still hold, heck operators, commutative semi-simple ring, um, natural inner product. Um, so here is our first theorem. I'll state it just for the square free case so you can see how we get all the rest of the forms. You guys remember the p-vid invariance? That's if the associated even Clifford algebra is ramified or not. Now I insert the spinner character. So for every divisor r of n, and for p, for, and then I, I'm, I have to change, I get to change the epsilon to an epsilon prime. All I do is I say, well, whatever my original epsilon was, I either leave it alone if, I, if p doesn't divide r, or I switch it to the negative if p does divide r. So you see how that, no matter what my original signs were, if I wanna switch them according to the binary representation in terms of the primes divided, I'm gonna swap, swap them out by taking the associated spinner character. Maybe the easiest way to think about it is if I take all of the spinner characters, I'm gonna change all, I'll see all the possibilities for signs. And then the statement is there's a Hecke equivariant isomorphism. I hope this looks familiar from Birch's theorem. All I did was I replaced the epsilon by an epsilon prime by changing the representation, okay? Oh, I, I should stay there for a second. This is the, the first major um, new idea is this is how you get all the rest of the forms. Nothing could be easier to compute. We were already doing all the hard work. Now, instead of counting them, we're gonna count them according to plus or minus one based on uh, the isometry and how, where it's divisible by P or not. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Okay, um, let me show you. G oh, yes, of course, Bjorn, yeah. You said you're flipping the signs of D. I mean, you're, do you want epsilon prime to be Yes, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Yes, you guys, the slide should not read epsilon p prime equals one or minus one. It should be epsilon that times epsilon p. I, I meant to switch the signs there. Thanks. Okay, let me show you how uh, how awesome this is. So here is a uh, level. It's about a million. It's square free. 
I'm gonna take, it has five prime divisors, so I can take that to be my D. So to make a quaternion algebra, I have to take an even finite number of places, so I take the, these five primes and the one at infinity. So now I can make a, a, that's the global compatibility for the quadratic space. And here is a representative from the class set. We, we chose this example because the number of representatives was 2016. We're already a year behind in getting this done. Okay, so here's how it works. So given this Q, which takes a little bit of uh, monkeying to make the quadratic space, we can compute the first four heck operators on this 2,000 dimensional space for all characters in four seconds. So it, this is what Birch meant when he says, you can generate interesting numbers much faster than you can read them. It's true, you can write down the heck operator so quickly, then you gotta do something with them, I guess, or, or I don't know, maybe you declare success after you've written them down. What would you like to do with these guys? I guess you wanna know the eigenforms, okay? So the natural thing to do here would be to take the eigenforms with rational heck eigenvalues, and we found those using linear algebra. These matrices are incredibly sparse. The sum of every row will have P plus one elements in them, so in a 2,000 matrix, um, there, there are lots of zeros. So you can use sparse linear algebra, um, the best implementation we could find of that is in magma. And in a minute, you can find that there are exactly five elliptic curves with conductor N. So after you plug in this N and you see exactly what they are. I, I see your hand, Drew. Let me finish one other thing on this slide. Um, this isn't a generic level by any stretch. It was cooked up to make 2016 um, in part. But just to see, to make a totally unfair comparison to modular symbols, um, or Sage or other ways of doing it, if you try to put, plug in this level for way two, um, it just crashes. It's ate up all of the memory on my machine and showed no sign of producing any output of any kind. Part of it has to do with trying to isolate the new subspace. Part of it is that the matrices are not necessarily as sparse as they are here. Lots of things just come to a crashing halt. So we take one minute, Magma will tell you nothing. Yes, Drew. So what if I want all of the eigenforms, not just some of the rational coefficients? Well, yeah, uh, we did not try. Uh, and that requires uh, prevailing with the linear algebra in magma. That'll be harder, and probably all of the time should then be spent on optimizing and doing the linear algebra in the appropriate way, and I don't know that we're the right people to, to tackle that problem. So we wanted to show that we believe that that will have a nice way to do it, like reducing mod a large prime L and putting the pieces back together using Chinese remainder or whatever, doing it over the complex numbers. I mean, the, this is something that uh, maybe we produce the HECA matrices and then the linear algebra cognoscenti um, tell us the eigenforms. Yes? So to clarify what you're doing here, you're doing the same thing that Cremona does where you take your T2 and you say, well, there are five candidates for the eigenvalue of that. It's going to be. That's right. So we look at a bunch of kernels. Yep, that's right. So the way, we, sorry, the way we compute these is if you had a form, the T2, which would be the number of points on an elliptic curve, that integer actually has to lie in the Hasse bound given by the trace of Frobenius. So that means that the eigenform will have to live in the kernel of T2 minus the possibilities for A2. So once you do that with the T2, the T2, T3, and the T5, you do enough of them to distinguish the classes, um, then you see that there are exactly five, and multiplicity one tells you exactly the ones that you get. Okay. Um, we're really excited about computing classical modular forms this way. We think we'll be able to peer much, much farther. And uh, let's see, what else do I wanna say before we're over? Um, the, I started the talk by saying this is a generalization of the méthode de Graaff, and here's the relationship. Um, what is the, how do you get the super singular curves back? Well, uh, and what is the role of the spinner norm? If you, uh, the endomorphism ring of a super singular elliptic curve is a maximal order in the quaternion algebra of discriminant P, and you get one or two super singular elliptic curves up to isomorphism over FP bar with that as its endomorphism ring, and the one or the two is determined by, so you get two of them, if and only if the J invariant lives in J, uh, FP squared, not in FP, if and only if the unique two-sided ideal of O of reduced norm P is not principal. So the fact that there's one or two, um, and typically two, I guess, um, is the, uh, exactly where the spinner norm enters in. Okay, so the spinner characters exactly account for the identification of E with its Galois conjugate, and so when we're saying if you're not isomorphic at certain values of P, depending on whether or not that, that, that's exactly the plus or minus one that the spinner normal keep track of. And that's why, uh, I don't know, you could, these are distinguished by an orientation following rivet. So if you want an actual bijection between super singular elliptic curves and orders, you have to give an orientation on that order. 
And apparently the HEC operators are acting on the orientations, and if you keep track of the possible signs, that's why the method requires this uh, extra uh, juice to get going. OK, so let me uh, quickly uh, give you some final extensions about what else we can do. Um, this will go by pretty quickly, but I hope you guys got the main point of, of the talk. Um, so uh, to work with level n, we need a reciprocity. If we want to move beyond square free level or even to work in square free level, how do you make the associated quadratic space? Well, um, we have to make quadratic forms. Those are determined locally. And if you could just take a form which was positive definite that looks like xy plus nz squared for all primes p, that would work. It doesn't always satisfy the global compatibility requirement. And so in order to fix this, this is where we need it to not be a square. So in our generalization, we need a prime that divides the level to an odd power. OK, and once you have that, you can use a different form. It looks like this. Instead of xy plus nz squared, we use x squared minus uy squared, where u is a non-square mod p, and then you take the appropriate norm form from the quadratic extension in the case p is equal to 2. And that's the quadratic space that we write down. Then you can fix the other levels um, using the other form. Or if you like, use this one to get new forms. So that's where, um, this is where a generalization from square free level will be allowed. We just need to figure out the right space. We have an understanding via the Clifford map about what space of modular forms we're going to get. Um, I call these orders uh, residually inert because uh, if you look in the correspondence, um, what between this ternary quadratic space and the order that you get, if you mod out by the Jacobson radical, you get fp squared. So in other words, this order, its residue field is fp squared. Um, and that's sort of where it comes from to keep track of the signs. That's one way to think about it. I mentioned that the things work over totally real fields. So uh, you get th this should work just as well um, to compute Hilbert modular forms. Um, OK, I'll show you this main theorem. I'm not sure how exciting it is. Um, this is what would, uh, how, how, if you want to go beyond square free level, as long as you're non-square, uh, we can compute the modular forms this way. You have to believe me that on the previous slide, I gave you a, a description of what quadratic space to work on and that the spinner characters are compatible. Um, it's hard to analyze these pre-computation steps because you need things like a non-square mod p. And so uh, that would probably require some probabilism. But if you uh, take those pre-computation steps as given, then the running time to compute tp is soft o of p times d. So the p is the p. So it's soft linear in the p. That's because there's p plus 1 things that we're summing over. And the d is the dimension of the space, so whatever that is. So it, it grows with the weight k um, linearly. The 2 to the minus r is because we get to pick out exactly that subspace of modular forms according to the atkin lehner involution. For those of you guys who do linear algebra, instead of doing linear algebra in a huge space, if I could write down the restriction of the matrix, matrix to a whole bunch of other smaller subspaces, all linear algebra operations are quadratic or worse in the dimension. So I'm getting a huge savings by carving up the space of modular forms into a bunch of other little smaller spaces on which I can do my linear algebra. OK, you guys, well, I tried to convince you today Birch's method for computing integral, computing modular forms is the same thing as understanding orthogonal modular forms um, via the even Clifford algebra. Um, we can generalize this to non-square level by adding a representation, get higher weight, consider all the atkin lehner involutions, and on and on. Um, and the most important thing about this implementation is that it is very fast. So Birch described this algorithm 30 years ago. So I'd like to say thank you to the CRM for 30 plus years of algorithmic arithmetic geometry. And here's to 30 more years. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, so I'll call for questions, but I'd just like to ask that um, you let me get to you with the microphone so that the question can be recorded for the video that they're making. Um, so questions for the speaker? Can you deal with square level? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know how to write down the quadratic. We don't know how to write down the quadratic space. So there's a global compatibility, and it's not clear. Actually, Boss Edixoven at the same conference wrote down a stable. Where are you, Boss? He wrote down a, he wrote down a stable model for x naught of p squared. So if p squared exactly divides, and I think we understand the right order, and what you get, um, maybe. Well, in this stable model, you have stuff coming from super singular points, 
right? And that counts for about half of the genus, and the other half comes from Igusa curves, and I don't know how to do that in terms of these Brandt matrices, right? You need other. Yeah. So that you cannot get, I think. So yeah, I don't, we could characterize the subspace that you do get. Yeah, that I believe, yeah, yeah. So I'm not, and then maybe we need another representation. I don't know, but yeah, I I, uh, I haven't I haven't gotten that far. P Pizer spends a lot of time thinking about this case too, where he writes down theta series and tries to identify the forms that way, but it doesn't. Uh, that's outside of my. But, but theory. anyway, you want to do something on a quaternion algebra, right? Definite. At, uh, so um, you need uh, some prime where it is not uh, well, where it comes from Jacques Langlands. Right? You, you, you cannot get everything, even if you take representations. That's right. You will not get uh, That's the right. discriminant modular form. For That's example. right. That's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. More questions? Oh. While the mic is being passed, I'd just like to remind the audience that the squares are 0% of integers. <laughs> Sorry to let you down, but OK. Uh, how do you manage for the Hilbert modeler case uh, the reductions of quadratic forms or identifying isometric ones? Uh, thanks for that question. Yeah, we do not have the explicit reduction theory, which made this so fast over Q, but the Pleskin Souvenir algorithm works all the same. You just consider your quadratic, your lattice, which is over a totally real field, and you consider it as a Z lattice. So that increases the dimension of the space, which means that the thing is slower. Um, but nevertheless, when you put in the auxiliary forms to require that your isometry is actually something that corresponds to a ZF or an OF isometry as opposed to just something over Z, then the same algorithm works. It detects isometry or not. And it's actually really fast for the same reason that uh, you can easily quickly identify if there's not an isometry. And uh, I. Uh, I'm not sure I have a whole lot more to say about that. I mean, it's uh, slower because you have to go one by one and see which one are you isomorphic to. Maybe for certain fields, we could do the one-time uh, reduction theory for lattices, and that might help us over, if you really care about Q square root five, like uh, William Stein and collaborators did for Hilbert modular forms, you could do a similar kind of one-time computation, use the symmetry of your base field and really crank. But our implementation works for an arbitrary, totally real field using this uh, pushing down the lattice. Okay, I suppose we should um, maybe end questions now and ask more later, but let's thank Please our speaker do. again. Thank you, guys.